السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا praise be to Allah alone we all praise him and we seek his help whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves a say no one can show him guidance may the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new live edition of your program, Ask Oda. We still have the same numbers, landlines beginning with the area code, country code 00202 uh, 288 or 249. And the email addresses are ask at uh, and gardens at huda.tv. We'll be more than happy, inshallah, to start taking your uh, live feed, uh, phone calls, emails, and Facebook questions, etc. Insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. The first question we have uh, today, but before that there was uh, a part of a question that is bending since last time. Sister Mona from Egypt who uh, inquired about seeing the Prophet Sallallahu in a night vision and the hadith, which we explained the authenticity of the hadith and also the meaning because some people uh, are confused in this regard. So we explained that, but one thing which he asked about what is the reward for seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream. As a matter of fact, seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream is the reward. To be blessed to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is definitely a, a magnificent thing, a beautiful thing. You know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith that uh, there will be people who would come after me and after you, after his companions, one of them would be willing to sacrifice everything in life, including his family, his wealth, his positions, just to lay his eyes on me once, to see me once, out of love to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So to get to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream, as we agreed in the last episode, to see him actually as him, with his traits which we are aware of, as we discussed in the beautiful book of the prophetic traits uh, by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, may Allah have mercy on him, then this is actually a word. We also uh, discussed earlier, as it is a part of the question, and how can we see the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. It is not for every person to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rather, uh, it's a message. But seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not mandate any new legislation. And that's why we see something which they claim it was the Prophet ﷺ and definitely it was not. Where the Prophet ﷺ or what they thought it was the Prophet ﷺ is instructing them either to do or not to do something new, then right away that should be dismissed. Even if the person happens to give the exact description of the Prophet Sallallahu it's a plain lie. Every once in a while we get calls, somebody says, uh, our scholar in this part of the world have seen the Prophet Sallallahu and he's asking him that the Ummah has uh, been deviant and in order to get back on the straight path, they need to recite Surah Al-Shams a thousand times or 10,000 times, right away that is dismissed. We don't even negotiate or discuss, and you, did you really see the Prophet Sallallahu You sure it was him? Because basically the content of the message is false. It's definitely false. So that should be dismissed right away. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said you shouldn't be doing this. Is it something that has been prohibited during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. 
then it should be dismissed, the whole thing. Why? Because by the demise of the Prophet ﷺ, the wahi has been seized. There is no more wahi after the death of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So any person who would claim, no matter how righteous he appears to us, how famous, how renowned he is or she is to his followers or to their followers, uh, says that I have seen the Prophet or Allah told me in a dream or blah, blah, blah. That should be dismissed. Al-Wahi has been seized by the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Listen to this ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-Islam dina. Uh, we'll talk about this ayah after this call, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Ummu Adam from Egypt. Assalamu alaykum, Sheikh. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sister Ummu Adam. I have a question concerning a woman traveling alone, uh, whether I can get an exception for that. I'm a Swiss consortor uh, living in Egypt, and my husband and me, we are separated since almost one year. Mm. But I'm still living in Egypt because we have a son together that is 20 months old. Mm. And therefore, I have a question, is it allowed for me to travel without mahram to visit my family in Switzerland? I see. Good airplane. Barakallah feekya, sister. Ummu Adam, thank you so much. Brother Abu Zaki from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, sir. How are you, sir? Barakallah feekya. Thanks to you for connecting my call, sir. I want to share one uh, very true story with the disaster by a Muslim person who betrayed his wife after 12 years. Actually, they got married. Uh, he got married and two girls, and a woman reverted to Islam. But after 10 years, he left his wife just recently, having another affair with another woman, and he got married. Now he is saying he will divorce her. That woman. Uh, when she left alone, she called uh, her parents, the non-Muslim parents. They said they can come if she follow in the religion, but she refused, and she has become very uh, with hurtful Muslim, and she prays five times prayer more than us. And uh, she replied she will never come to that religion, and now she is away from her parents, and uh, brought her husband like two thousand kilometers away, and trying to survive. Uh, and I salute that lady. And my family is trying to help and select as much. Please, I want to request you to pray for her. And please advise her what she should do. Okay. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Abu Zaki. And thank you so much. And uh, also thanks to your family. And may Allah keep the sister steadfast on his straight path. Ameen. Um, sister Ummu Adam, uh, I'm sorry to hear that you were separated from your husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, either reconcile between you or give you and him uh, a better replacement. And in any case, your question as a revert and traveling alone without uh, a mahram in Islam is not permitted unless uh, if you don't have a male mahram and it is a necessary journey that you must do it. There is no choice. So in this case, we resort to the least harm, which is that you can travel in a safe company or for instance we say that your family in this place would give you a farewell deposit you at the airport and the other family would be waiting for you uh, at the uh, other destination to pick you up right away and it will be best if we make sure that it is a, a direct flight there is no connections and so on this is to minimize the risk of uh, things which may happen such as uh, I believe a couple years ago when there was an ash cloud and uh, uh, the flights were suspended for several days and many women were stranded at the airport sleeping on, on, the, on the floor for, for several days. Uh, so Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only legislates what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala inspires him to do for the benefit and the welfare of humanity at large, not only Muslims. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ahmed from Ghana. Ahmed, assalamu alaikum. 
Can you raise your voice, please, Ahmed? Allah is the last thing. Shaykh, may Allah bless your wife. Jazakallah khairan. Go ahead. Brother Ahmed, yeah. I have difficulty Wait, brother, hearing you. I have a few questions. Okay, go ahead. Number one is... Brother Ahmed, do me a favor uh, and mute your TV. What Ahmed. is that do I allow my mother to get into my marriage? Brother Ahmed, mute your TV, please. Okay. If yeah, Shaykh, um, I'm married to a lady, and it's like my mother wants, her, wants my wife to do virtually everything for her, mm. cook for her, wash her things, and that has been bringing confusion between me and my mother. Mm. Is that acceptable? Is, is your mother living with you in the same house, under the same roof? Yeah, mashallah. My, my mother is living... Mashallah, we are living in the same house. Okay. And uh, one more question. Can you afford to hire a maid? Yes, we have our own house. My mother is saying she will allow me to move out. Uh, Brother Ahmed, can you afford to hire a maid? Ahmed, assalamu alaikum. Taib. Brother Saleh from the KSA. Sister Sara from the KSA. I'm sorry. Sister Sara, assalamu alaikum. You're live on Askuda. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, yes, I wanted to know if anybody can give um, zakat or, or zakat to their mother or grandmother. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sister Sara. Brother Ahmed from Ghana. MashaAllah, he's, uh, he's married, and um, his, his mother is living with him in the same house, and it's a blessing. Wallahi, it is a blessing. But sometimes, you know, you have the wife and the mother-in-law issue, uh, which is sometimes very complicated over very minor things. Just last night I got an email just to read, it's like a newsletter, several pages about you have to be very patient to read the very minute incidents which happen between the wife and the mother-in-law which uh, evolve into big problems in serious issues and breaking up the family and so on. So the wife has to be very patient and have to understand that today she's a wife Tomorrow she's going to be a mother-in-law, soon, in a few years. The way you like to be treated whenever you are a mother-in-law, you should be treating your mother-in-law as well. If you honor your mother-in-law and you serve her, it's like you're honoring and serving your mother exactly. And that would give you the same exact reward. And it would really develop and increase the love uh, in your husband's house towards you because if you're loving him so much, you're also serving his mother. And you should love his mother because she was the reason behind his existence. And she gave him to you on a golden tray. You didn't have to raise him. You didn't have to spend any penny on him. Rather, now he's supporting you. So when we look at the equation from this angle or point of view, that the, the wife would really appreciate what the mother-in-law did. And also, she would understand that she's getting old. Maybe she's lonely after losing her husband. And uh, they shouldn't be in competition. There should not be jealousy. Rather, uh, she should treat her as her own mother. I know that this is a theory. And in practice, very few people, very few families would really look at it this way. In addition to sometimes some mother-in-laws, uh, mothers-in-law, uh, they, they're very demanding. And some others like to treat their daughters-in-law like uh, servants or maids, and they take this for granted. So we have to keep balance for the welfare of the entire family. So for instance, I ask you, if you can afford to hire a maid, that would really solve a lot of problems. Okay? Even if this maid is only to serve your mother, and to cook the kind of food that she likes it, maybe spicy, maybe whatever. Okay, if you can afford it, that's a blessing. Alhamdulillah, shukla. If you can't, 
then there is a daily routine that you have to do that once you lock the door behind you and your wife you have to show her how much you appreciate what she's doing for your mother that's a daily homework that you have to do trust me also remind her and yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a magnificent reward for both of you for serving the mother and ask her to try to overcome the minor things before they, uh, they get bigger, you know, and try to compliment her and compensate for any errors or shortcomings that may happen from your mother for innocence. And also with regards to the mother, you can convey a beautiful message that how much my wife loves you, appreciates you, and she's asking me to do anything that can make you happy and so on. And this is not a lie. This is of trying to reconcile and bring love and harmony to the house. If the husband says, I got a headache, I can't take it anymore, and so on, you are the only person who can play this buffer role. We cannot have somebody from outside to play. So if you manage to play right, then the wife will serve your mother happily. There must be a reason. Why am I doing this? For innocence, if you, as the husband, if your mother-in-law is still alive, and you treat her like wise, you send her gifts every once in a while, you pick up the phone and check on her, you make her love you, then your wife automatically will have to do the same. And she would serve your mother with pleasure. Okay? It is not only uh, one way giving all the time, but it's give and take. Okay? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and make a lot of dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, create harmony and love in your house. But definitely you should keep your mother in your house if she's a single parent and uh, if she's old and no one to look after her because this is your pass or key to heaven. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in one, hadith, in one hadith, may he lose, may he disgrace, uh, they said whom he said one who witnesses his parents at an old age or at least one of them, and he does not enter paradise through serving them. So it's a blessing to have, to have your, uh, both parents, or one of them is still alive, which means this is an easy access to Al-Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to serve our parents, those who are still alive, and to always remember to make dua for those who passed away. Barakallahu feekum. Sister Sarah from the case A, eh? giving zakat to one's mother or grandmother is not permissible. Giving zakat to one's mother or grandmother or son or grandson or children or grandchildren is not permissible because you're responsible for supporting them financially. Except if they happen to be in debt and they cannot pay off their debt. So because their debt, which was not to spend on their basic needs, rather for another reason, it's not your responsibility. So in this case, settling their debt from your zakah fund is permissible. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Ruhaima from Ghana. Yes. <coughs> Naam, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I got married some months back and um, I'm having problems with my mother-in-law. Mm. And... Um, I'm a working lady, and I hardly get time to stay back home to do most of the chores my mother-in-law expects me to do. The only thing I do is when I come back from work, I get to cook for her. But most of the time, she doesn't eat my food. And she says, because I don't stay back home to do all the chores she expects me to do, that means that I don't respect her. And I just don't know what to do. And I have my own apartment. My office gave me an apartment to stay close to the workplace. My husband is not here too. He's in a different district and it's far. So he stays away in the district. But when we married, the mother said we should leave our apartment and come and stay in her house. Okay. And my husband says, well, my, I don't want to displease my mother. So let's leave our apartment and move to my mother's house. And I agreed and went there. But it's like my career is affecting the relationship I have with my mother-in-law and I don't know if I have to quit my job to please my mother-in-law. And I don't know to, whether it would be appropriate to move out. Because the woman says if we move out to our own apartment, then my husband to find someone to call his own mother. So I don't know whether I should leave because I can't 
come between a mother and a son. And I try my best to please my mother-in-law, but she doesn't appreciate whatever I do for her. Wallahi, thank you so much. May Allah bless you and reward you for that. Um, it's a challenge. You know, if there is a chance that you, you move to an apartment which is next door to your mother-in-law, that would be fantastic. So this way, you have your own private life. You wear whatever you want to wear at home. You design your home or your apartment, whichever way you like. And meanwhile, you're checking on her constantly, cooking for her, which is something, as I just discussed earlier with Brother Ahmed from Ghana as well. Uh, it seems like it's a Ghana serious problem today. Uh, but it shouldn't be a problem. I don't have to repeat what I said earlier. Uh, you can just uh, listen to the rerun. But uh, it would be a win-win game if you can move to a flat which will be next door to her. And also look at it this way. If you have to work, because it's a different issue, whether you have to work or not. If you have to work and leaving your kids sometimes under your mother's, uh, mother-in-law's supervision, uh, that's a blessing. You're not worried about them, actually. You feel that if you have children, uh, they are in safe hands and so on. But otherwise... Sometimes there are obligations which we cannot get rid of or deny. You cannot just say to your husband, I married you only, I don't want your mother in life. That's not fair. And again, if you ever think this way, please think about this. A few years from now, you will be a mother-in-law. Definitely. If you have children, inshallah, you'll be a mother-in-law. And you never know what will happen. Maybe you end up having to live with either your son-in-law or daughter-in-law. How would you like to be treated? Thank you so much. Um, with salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A leap from the case. Say hey, salamu alaikum, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Yes. Salam alaikum. How are you? Welcome, Mr. Salam, How are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, okay, Sheikh. So my question is that there's so much going on in the Muslim countries right now. Like we see the videos on YouTube and Facebook and it is so disturbing. So I want to ask what is our... What can we do and what is our right towards the Muslim brothers and sisters in Egypt or Syria or like anywhere in the world? There are so many Muslims suffering. So what can we do as women and what is our right towards them and our duties? Thank you, Sister. Barakallah um, feek. I have to admit I'm very impressed that um, a young caller is very concerned about what happens in various Muslim societies, away from the society in which she's living in. And basically, this is the attitude that the Prophet ﷺ prescribed for every believer, to worry about the affairs of the entire Muslim ummah at large. No one can say, I can do nothing. As a matter of fact, there is a lot to do. Yes, there is a lot to do. For instance, uh, one thing which doesn't cost you any money or any effort, which is making dua in your sujood. Second thing is to expect well and good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that perhaps it could be your dua, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose from amongst billions of other prayers to answer. It depends because maybe you're very sincere in your dua, you're very concerned. Subhanallah, I was very impressed in Japan, and Muslims in Japan, like only 100,000, including the reverse, the expats, and everybody, maximum. SubhanAllah, and just a few masajid. But the amount of concern and awareness that they have uh, with regards to the affairs of the Muslim Ummah, like everywhere you go, they discuss about what is happening in Syria and in Egypt. Wallahi, even the youngsters, even the kids, they're so occupied when you see a four years old kid is crying because of seeing in the news what is happening in Egypt and the massacres in here and there. These kids are crying. Why? Because their parents are concerned. 
And I said, just make dua. I say, brother, we're making dua day and night. We can't eat. We can't drink. We're very concerned. Is there anything that we can do? This concern is one of the means of fulfilling your duties towards the ummah. Dua. If there is a chance to support financially, of course. They do have rights upon us to support financially. Especially for those who are on the battlefield. And those who are in refugees camps. There are millions of Syrian people in refugee camps. So they are, of course, most eligible for our zakah and voluntary charity uh, and so on. Now, with the social websites participating or taking part and playing the role of spreading the news and talking about it and so on, it is very important. Recently, for instance, um, <clears throat> this American senator who visited Egypt, and she is a Republican, and she... Uh, uh, her name is Michelle. Uh, I don't remember the last name, and I do really care. And she was saying that when the military withdrew the president and they destroyed the democratic process, and she was cheering before the television, and she was very happy. We have to expose that. We have to expose that to the American people, to the voters, that this woman is an enemy of freedom, for innocence. And she is pro-bloodshed, and she is pro-whatever. So this is a very simple role that you're going to do by sharing such video. Okay? But make sure that you only share the facts. You do not play any role in spreading mischief or false news and so on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abu Asya from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I just wanted to mention that uh, we rode the train together, I think, uh, from Muzdalifah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last uh, past season. But you were all the way in the back, so I didn't get a chance to greet you. Barak I just want to let you know. Barakallah, um, thank you so much. No problem, no problem. Uh, I just have a question, and it might be a typical question, but um, I have some doubts, so I'm trying to find the truth here. Uh, I know a lot of people asking about if my job is, halal or haram, and for a lot of people, because their job is away from riba or direct um, dealing with uh, you know, like alcohol and all that stuff, uh, automatically they assume that their job is halal. So my situation is like this. I work for a telecom company, and specifically do wireless um, uh, networks mm -hmm. for uh, specific buildings, for schools, hospitals. Um, even hotels, stadiums, casinos, and all that. Now, uh, the question is this. Uh, sometimes we're assigned to do uh, or to design a system to enhance coverage in these buildings. And in some occasions, we'll run into a hotel or a stadium or a casino where we know that these people, they deal with uh, muharramat, like alcohol or gambling. Is um, me taking part in this project considered uh, something that's prohibited, or is it because I'm not employed by those buildings, I'm just providing a service through my company, uh, I'm uh, uh, any, uh, excused from that. So I just want to know, because that's a gray area, and I'm not really 100% sure what I'm standing here. Now, Barakallah Fiqh, brother Abu Asya. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I can uh, sense sincerity in, in your question. Uh, as a matter of fact, the job you're doing is halal. When you serve in halal area or you offer services to those who are offering halal services. Yani, stadiums, no problem. Hotels, no problem. Because the hotels are not designed for only it's not a casino. But a casino, a nightclub, definitely not. That's 100% haram. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ We should help and assist in achieving righteousness and piety. And we should not play any part or participate in aggression or causing or committing any sins. Look at it this way, a cab driver who is picking people up, going back and forth. 
Then he stopped in front of a nightclub and he's picking up a prostitute. Or he knows for sure this woman is lying dead. Is it halal or haram? I think he would not even double think about it. Right away, say this is haram. Why? Because he is participating and facilitating the haram. Likewise. Okay? So, uh, inshallah, Allah will find you a way out to be excused from minor jobs like this. Casinos, no way. Like clubs, haram. 100%. But stadiums, companies, schools, this is all halal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Amatullah from France. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, I've got three questions for you, sure. uh, if you're okay. Uh, first, uh, I want to precise that I'm an imam, doesn't have a strong belief in God, and doesn't really practice this one as a Muslim would do. Uh, and, that, and when I first decided to wear hijab and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was wearing the headscarf with the simple maxi, maxi skirt and tried to wear loose garments. But with time, uh, I decided to wear the jibab, mm -hmm. uh, which is a garment that I really like. And my mother doesn't want me to, to wear this. And um, she hates that kind of garment. And I wanted to know if uh, if it affects my, my relationship with my mom. Um, is it haram or not if I, uh, if I keep it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's my first question. And then, and then I want to ask you, um, who's um, uh, regarding to the, uh, sorry, um, the, um, the obedience to the legal guardian? I want to know if uh, there is a... Uh, how can I say it? Uh, who the woman must obey to, and uh, and the evidence to the legal guardian uh, more important than the others. I just want to know if the woman just have to to um, how can I say this? Um, if I must only obey to my dad, or if I can obey to uh, other persons in my family, for example. Okay, Amatullah, basically That's the cool. second question is still vague. I would um, kindly request you to repeat it, rephrase it in a simpler way. Can you hear me? Amatullah, mm -hmm. uh, you, you're still there. Can you repeat your question? Uh, I would like to understand what you meant with the second question. Amatullah, okay. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, well, hear you. Okay, would you please convey the message to her in the control that I would like for you to repeat your second question. It's not clear at all. Okay, you can uh, as well still deposit your question. Inshallah, uh, they will collect it from you and will answer all these questions right uh, after the break. Uh, brothers and sisters, in a couple of minutes, we'll join you back. Please stay tuned. <laughs> to Medina, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions faced lots of troubles and difficulties and enmities and obstacles in the way to Medina before the Hijrah to Medina from Mecca. Uh, also Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has assisted his beloved Prophet and supported him in order to complete his mission and to, uh, uh, to immigrate to Medina. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, has granted us this great Prophet and his companions. Now the question why the immigration to Medina, the Hijrah of Rasulullah and his companions, was a turning point in the history of uh, Hijrah and the history of Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, what are the sacrifices that the Prophet Muhammad has faced with his companions? Some of these difficulties, inshallah, we will learn together and we will focus in some lessons. What are the lessons that we take from these incidents, inshallah, in our program, uh, Road to Medina? My dear brothers, stay tuned with us, inshallah, in this great uh, uh, event of Hijrah. We will, inshallah, focus on some of the lessons uh, of in this program, Road to Medina. May Allah make it easy for us and accept our good deeds and gather us with our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Jannah. Amen.
is a beautiful recipe for happiness in this life and the next. But if you don't have the right ingredients for it, the meal won't be so delicious. You look for that taste, but you can't find the same taste. You can't find that same sweetness because you're missing certain ingredients. So much on these things, we don't realize the things that we do in our everyday life, the things that we do in our actions, it's having a big effect on our prayers. We're like, what is missing? Where are these, these missing ingredients? Where did they go? Why can't I find the pleasure in my prayer? Why can't I benefit from my prayer? أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without partner and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, our ultimate role model. In a cave in Mount Hira, the revelation came. Read, O oh Muhammad, read in Allah's name. May the blessing. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back. Sister Amatullah from France. We're able to get to a second question as well. The first question is about a situation. MashaAllah, she started practicing and wearing a hijab and a full outer garment uh, to suit the hijab. But the parents, particularly the mother, is not happy with that. She objects to that and she's displeased with her. So she's concerned that if this is affecting her relationship to her mother, would that be considered as a disobedience? No, it is not. But we have to find a way not to compromise, rather to convince the parents that what you're doing isn't only for your own good, but also rather for their own good. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Tahreem in ayah number 6, Ya ayuha alladhina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nasu wal hijara O you who believe, protect yourselves and your family members, those who are under your guardianship, again is the fire of hell. You know how many parents, and this is a message to your kind mother, you know how many parents are dying to have a child like yours? You know how many parents would love their daughters to wear hijab and they have been struggling with them and they would do anything in life anything, whatever it takes to convince their children to be rightly guided to pray and the girls to wear hijab and so on and to stop smoking or to stop drugs or to stop illicit relationship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it you on a gold tray for free, for granted. And you're not happy? 
this is basically the worst way of being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This daughter or this son who is not obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I did not invest in him will be a curse for the parent on the day of judgment. But such child who is dutiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's trying to obey Allah the Almighty and comply with the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ is my asset. That is a child who will benefit me on the day of judgment. Will benefit me whenever I'm in the grave. I still receive continuous hasanat. So if one have several children, one who remain like that, is not committed, is not religiously uh, committed or practicing whatsoever. A child who doesn't pray, a daughter who's not wearing hijab, a boy who has a girlfriend, basically because their parents did not invest in them, did not teach them anything. Then all of a sudden, one of them has been rightly guided. What happens? What happens is that when you die, and definitely you will die, and I will die, and everybody will die. Who will benefit you after you die? The one whom you are struggling with them to make them losers. To make them quit the hijab and quit the prayers and quit the, the sunnah. But those who are nightclub going or having a boyfriend and a girlfriend or a girl who is not wearing hijab would not benefit you an art. Rather, their sins, you will receive similar sins to them. Why? Because you misled them. You did not put them on the right track. I want to share a very interesting story with you. Where I used to live, and since my childhood, there was a person who used to work for the Secret Service. And the Secret Service, these guys were ruthless, have no deen. They used to torture people, particularly the religiously committed one, and torture to death. Okay? These people had been cursed by everybody in the community. So whenever they see a young man who is a, a masjid going all the time, he goes to the masjid or started growing a beard or a girl who started wearing niqab or whatever, they track them, they follow them, and they fire a post against them so that whenever he applies for a job, they will ban him from the job. If he's traveling out of the country or whatever, they would make their life miserable. Most of uh, the so-called Muslim countries, under the secular rule, their regimes, their governments, and their security services were only utilized to protect the regimes and to crack down any Islamic activities. Masajid are their enemies. So what happens is, he happened to visit me because I started going to the masjid on a regular basis and so on. And he files the post. Subhanallah, this guy who is very active in his job, he's very known. All his children his sons and daughters. His daughters all wore niqab. And his sons have become religiously committed after they were, you know, lost, grew beards and started going to the masjid, they memorized the Quran and so on. The guy, by the end of his life, got a cancer. And this is nothing compared to what is awaiting him of, you know, I'm not going to say punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him. Why am I praying for him now? Because his sons and daughters who are religiously committed, they have toured the country, going to every family, asking them to pardon their father, forgive their father, and pray for their father. And you know what? I've forgiven him. A lot of people have forgiven him, and they started praying for him. Why? Because of his children. You should be very proud of your daughter, not the other way around. You should not suppress her. You should not push her away from Allah or pull her away from the deen. Rather, you should say, honey, I'm very proud of you. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll take this last phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Um Muhammad from Egypt. Hello. Hello, Sister Um Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I have a question. Um, can you explain to me what talaq Ala Ibra means, is it the same as a, um, a kula, kula, the voice? Okay. Can you tell me the difference between that and, and also the Ida, the Ida period? 
in the process if, if, he, if the husband wants to return back to his wife. Barakallahu Barakallahu Thank you so much. Uh, Sister Amatullah's second question is uh, that whether the children are mahram, can she travel alone with them and also can she stay in front of them without the hijab and so on? Are they a mahram and can they function as a mahram? If the child is your own, and he has reached the age of puberty, he's a definite uh, mahram, yani you can, he can travel with you legitimately. Okay? So if you're saying, I'm traveling with my son, how old is he reached the age of puberty? Fine. And you can also take his sister overseas and travel the travel distance, no problem. But if the child is underage, then he does not qualify to be a mahram because he's supposed to be protective. Uh, but a child... Uh, is definitely is in need for protection, not the other way around. What about my uh, husband's uncles, whether paternal or maternal? Are they maharim to me, plural of mahram? The word mahram means a person whom you're not allowed to marry forever, permanent. Such as those who have been listed in Surah, um, in Ayah number 32 of Surah Al Nur, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا لِبُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَائِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَاءِ بُعُولَتِهِنَّ This ayah talks about whom you're not allowed to marry forever, and that's why it's okay to sit without hijab before them. And also the other ayah of Surah An-Nisa حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمْهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُ الْأَخِي All the way to the end. is talking about the maharim, plural of maharim. Here is a question. My brother-in-law, is he a maharim? Yeah, I can marry him. You can marry him because you're already married. Whether you're married to his brother or to somebody else, you're already married. In shigal al mahal. But in case that uh, the husband dies or is separated from the wife and after the idda. If she is interested in marrying who used to be her brother-in-law, is it permitted? Of course, it is permissible. But if she is interested to marry who used to be her father-in-law or son-in-law or stepfather or stepson, that's all included in the maharim of the ayah of surah and they say, no, you can't. So this is a permanent mahram. So whenever we speak about mahram, we speak about the one who is permanently forbidden for the person to marry, whether it's he or she. So for you, sister, your uh, husband's uncles are not maharim. Why not? Apply the rule. In case, let's speak about another example. If the person is separated from the husband, then later on, after the idda, happen to be interested on whom you used to be the uncle of her husband. Is it permissible to get married? It is permissible. So in this case, he's not your mahram. I hope we can comprehend uh, this. The ayah which I started uh, the program with in answering Sister Mona from Egypt, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام مدينة which was revealed on the Eid al-Adha in the farewell hajj. Uh, which is the last hajj. Uh, and it was the only hajj that the Prophet ﷺ performed, which means, it was revealed in Mina, today I have completed your religion for you and perfected my favor upon you. And I'm pleased with Islam as your religion. Means, this ayah means, deen is complete. So any person would come to us and would say, that I have seen the Prophet in a dream, or even Allah in a dream, and he has told me that, don't do this, or do that. And if something which is not in the Sharia of do's and do not do's, it should be dismissed right away. Uh, I wanted to elaborate furthermore on a very important question which I received, but unfortunately we're out of time, so hopefully, inshallah, I'll begin the next program by answering this question. And also I would get to answer Sister Um Muhammad from Egypt about the difference between Talaq, Ibra and Da'idda. Qulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah liya wa lakum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyana Muhammad 
وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته